From the depths of the grave, I called for what? For help. <laughs> Ever done that? Ever been there? Yeah. And you listened to my cry. The King James Version, and I like a part of this version a whole lot, it says, and said, I cried by reason of mine, there's that ownership again, mine affliction. And the NIV, it was distress, now it's my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell. I'm going to talk about that more later. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And then the last one is the New Living Translation. It says this, he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. What kind of trouble? <laughs> He's in pretty big trouble, right? In my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the world of the dead. And Lord, you heard me. Jonah is amazed. He's surprised that God even heard him, would even listen to him in this situation. Why? It's because he had run from the Lord. He had basically said, forget you, God. Now, we all do this from time to time. I see, he said, God, I know you said go to Nineveh, but I'm going to Tarsus because I don't want to do what you wanted me to do. I'm not going to do your word. And so he ends up in this whale's fish's belly, <laughs> in this fish's belly, and, 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 and he's amazed because God answers him. Uh, I want us to make sure we get this. Obviously, we don't understand the power of prayer. Uh, you see, the first thing that Jonah did when he was in this fish's belly is what? Pray. And, and, and it's going to be through prayer he gets out. We don't understand the power of prayer. And, and Jonah 1, 9, I want to show you something. Uh, back in, in chapter 1, we read this. It says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the creator, the God of heaven, the creator who made the sea and the land. See, Jonah realized something that... I don't know if we realize it or not, but what prayer is, is we're coming before God, the creator of heaven, the creator of the earth, creator of the sea. We're coming before him, and it's like, you know, we know we can pray, and we know that if we pray, it really does good, but yet we wait until we're inside the fish before we do. Why is that? Why can't we get a handle on the power of prayer? Uh, ha have you ever heard someone say something, you know, like this? Man, maybe you've said it. Man, things are really horrible. They're bad. They're just really, really, really bad. They're, they're just horrific. I don't know if they can get any worse. All we can do now is pray. We, we wait until the last thing to pray. Why? Why didn't Jonah pray when the winds got strong or, or when the waves and the storm got going or, or at least before they threw him out of the boat? <laughs> Why didn't he at least pray in, swimming in the ocean? Why does he have to wait until he's inside of this horrible circumstance before he'll pray? <laughs> it's a last option we do. And how do you think that makes God feel? See, I think it breaks his heart. Rather than being the first thing that we should think about and do when things get tough, it's the last thing we do. I guess I can pray now. You will, yeah. You, you will pray. <laughs> Let me show you some stuff here because I think it's so important in understanding prayer. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of what? Throne of grace. God's throne is a throne of grace. And so few Christ followers and believers know what grace is. But let us come before the throne of grace that we may, now here's some fill-ins for you, we can obtain mercy and find grace. You, you get grace and mercy differently. You obtain mercy, but you have to find grace. <clears throat> Why? Why do we even need them? We, we, let's come boldly for the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy and find grace to what? Is, that, is it up there? So that we can, to what? To help when? In time of need. In time of trouble. When I'm in a mess. When I'm in a mess, what I need is mercy and grace. That's what I really need. 
And, and so few of us really understand from where that comes. That only comes to you when you're praying. Let us go boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain and find. It's before the throne of grace, it's in our prayer time that these things will come to us. And these are the very things that we must have when we're in trouble. Now, let me try to explain to you. What is the difference between mercy and grace? Few people really understand. What mercy is, first of all, and we obtain this, what mercy is, is like the hammer coming down on you. And, and you know the hammer's coming down, you know that the hammer should come down, and it not only can, but it might come down, and the hammer's coming down. What mercy is, is, is God stopping the hammer from coming down on you. It's like you're in court, and, and you're before the judge, and you know you're in big trouble, and you say, I'm going to throw myself on the mercy of the court. And what, you, what you're doing is you're saying, judge, whether it be a he or a she, you're saying, have mercy on me. Be as easy on me as you possibly can. And that's what mercy is. Mercy is, is, is stopping the hammer from coming down on us when it could or maybe even when it, when it should. You see, that's what we do. And we get this in prayer. I want us to see this. When, this is one reason that we first thing we do when we're in a big mess is pray. So we'll stop the hammer from coming down on us. And then there's, then there's, finding, there's finding grace. Grace is not mercy. They're totally different. We get them so confused. Grace, grace is this. Grace is God giving us wisdom and abilities that we don't possess in our own selves. We, it's, it's not like we were even born with, these, with this wisdom and ability. It's, it's God gave it to us through prayer. It's, it's wisdom and ability that we don't have that we can use to get us out of times of trouble. When we need help, it's God giving to us the ability and the wisdom to get out of the situation. Paul, the apostle, said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He says, but by the grace of God, not the mercy, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I became successful. I figured this thing out. I had the wisdom to do this by the grace of God. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, his grace, which, which, I, which I found which God gave to me, the abilities and the wisdom which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored. See, you take grace and you use it. You don't use mercy. Mercy is just given to you. You take the grace God's given to you and you utilize it. You labor with the grace. And he says, I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but what? But the wisdom. But the, but the abilities, the grace of God which was with me. See, what grace does is give you something to work with. You're in a mess, and you need some wisdom, and you need something to help you get out of this mess. That's grace. And you only obtain mercy, and you only find grace when you pray. So why don't we pray? Why do we have to be in the belly of the fish before we'll start crying out to God? How many whales, fishes, bellies can we not experience if we would just pray? Pray when the wind starts, or, or pray when the, when, the, when the storm begins, or, or at least pray when they throw us out of the boat. <laughs> uh, I love the way the King James Version says this. You see, it says, because we've like, got to be in hell before we'll pray, right? So here's what the King James Version says in Jonah 2.2. In Jonah it says, And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. <laughs> cried. Anybody ever been there? And you cried out. And, and, and this is, I cried out, and thou heardest me. Now, hell would be the furthest point that Jonah could get from God. Jonah realized, man, I have really messed up. I'm as far from you as I can get. I, I have really messed up. See, some of us could say it this way. <clears throat> from the belly of a hellish marriage, I cried out, and, and, and you saved me. So, some of us could say, from the belly of disease, I cried out, and you, you heard me, and you answered me. From the belly of my depression, I thought I was going under, but I cried out. And though I hadn't done what I was supposed to do, and though I wasn't doing what you'd asked me to do, I cried out and you still heard me. 
I want us to get that point today. I don't care where you are. You can still cry out, even in a, in, in a fish's belly, and cry out, and God will still hear you. <laughs> Jonah chapter 2, verse 3 through 7, read it to you, says, now I want you to watch here the interaction now happening between Jonah and God, okay? <laughs> God's going get to get you to a place where he can interact with you. Here we go. You hurled me into the deep into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept me. God's interacting with Jonah. Sometimes, you know, I don't know if I want God to interact with me, right? Your waves, your breakers, you hurled to me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. I know I have messed up. Yet, I will look again toward your holy temple. I'm going to fix it. Jonah says, I'm going to fix it. I've messed up, but I'm, I'm, I'm about to fix this. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. In the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. Interaction between you and God, between Jonah and God taking place here. See, Jonah, hear me now, you're going to pray. I want to tell you, you're going to pray. You might not want to, but God's going to provide some situations in your life for you. And I'm going to show you why here in, in just a second. See, technically, it was, uh, it was the guys in the boat with Jonah that threw him out, right? It was, it was the people that technically hurled Jonah in, into, into the sea, technically. But Jonah was wise enough to understand that it was really God. Are you wise enough? See, when, when we go through stuff, it's always people. We blame people. We blame this person. We blame that person. It's at their hands that this is happening. When are we going to get smart enough and wise enough to see that it's really God dealing with us? And it's probably taking place to start with because we're running from the Lord. We, we're not doing something that he's told us to do. When are we going to smarten up and see, you know, this is really God dealing with me. <laughs> And Jonah's saying here in this, in this passage, you know, the seaweed, the waves, the times of the depression, the, 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 the stress, all the stuff that he's in. What he's, what he's saying is, I'm as good as dead. It's over for me. Verse 6 says this, but you brought my life up. Brought it where? Up. See, up until this point, Jonah was going down. But you, with interaction with God... You brought my life up from the pit. From where? The pit. Oh, Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. Going to talk more about remembering him in just a minute. I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. See, it's when Jonah prayed, when he interacted with God, that life turned around and he went up. I prayed, rose to you, to your holy temple. See, Jonah was at a place a bad place, the worst possible place he could be. He was in deepest depression, swirling seas, waves, storms, total loneliness, banishment, seaweed choking out life. And then Jonah prayed. And then life changed. What I want you to see here is that your life will change if you'll pray. Instead of things going down, you'll obtain mercy and grace initially, and things will go up. We need to pray. I wanted you to fill this in because I think it's one of the best things that the Lord showed me in studying this chapter. You can be in deepest depression, swirling, drowning situations, storms, loneliness, whatever, but not be hopeless. Not be hopeless. So I hear people say, it's hopeless. No, it's, it's, it's not hopeless. It's not hopeless if you're a Christ follower. It's, it's never hopeless if you can pray. 
If you can pray, there is hope. Because what you've done in your time of prayer is put your hope, not in the situation, but you changed it and you're putting your hope in God. See, we get so messed up because we put our trust, we get it focused on the wrong things. And we've got to learn to put our trust and our hope in God. Here's what Psalms 43, 5 says. Why are you so downcast, O my soul? You know, mind, why are you messing with me so badly? Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. And then he says, for, then I'm going to praise you. You're, 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 you're mourning. And weeping turns to praise. For I will praise him, my Savior and my God. <laughs> See, your life can go up if you'll hope in the right thing. You pray. You put your hope in God. Life went up for Jonah because there was interaction in prayer with God. I want to make sure we, we don't miss a very vital point here that I, that I see. See, the entire time that Jonah was going through his ordeal... Uh, uh, the whole time that all of this storm and seas and waves and seaweed and fish and all this was going on, the whole time it was happening, God was working Jonah's miracle. The whole time all this stuff was going on, God was still working. God never gave up on Jonah. Am I right? God's never going to give up on you. And I don't care what you're going through, God's still working. And he's going to work your miracle. But now you've got to go through the process. See, get it right now. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And what did Jonah do? I don't want to do it. I know you said go this way. I'm going this way. Right? I'm not going to do it. So all of a sudden, Jonah puts himself into a position to have to go through a process. So Jonah goes through the wind. And Jonah goes through the storm. And Jonah goes through the getting thrown out of the boat. And Jonah goes through the sea and the seaweed. And finally in the fish belly. Jonah goes through this process before he gets to his miracle. Had Jonah just obeyed the Lord, there would have been no need for a process. But we don't do that. We don't do what God says, and so now we're going through a process. You're going to get your miracle. You're going to get out of the situation, but not without the process. He's like, it's going to happen. Maybe, maybe it's like this in your life. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you've got this horrible, horrible thing from the doctor, the, the, this, this bad report from, from the doctor, and, and you're looking for a miracle. Well, you're going to get your miracle, but now you're going to have to go through the process. Whatever's going on in your life, there's always this process. God will work your miracle. But you see, we, we, we look at it wrong. We, we look at it like God's disciplining us. If that's not what he's doing. This is how God deals with each of us. It's like a child. It's like a parent taking the child through the process that has been disobedient, that has been rebellious. The child now is going to face the circumstances. It's going to face the consequences and have to go through the process to get out of the trouble. And this is what God does with us. And we go through this process and we process through it. And as we process through it, our miracles working. Don't, don't stop the process. Your miracle's there. But don't stop the process. And you won't get your process, you won't get your miracle until you finish the process. And what's amazing to me is we look at it like God's beating us up. Here, let me give you this fill-in. We call it God disciplining us. God calls it love. Do you ever discipline your children? I hope so. Do you love them? It's not discipline, it's love. Because this is how God deals with us, each one of us. It's how he handles us. It's how he teaches us and how he leads us and how he guides us and how he loves us. He's a great father. You got to go through the process. And it's so that we can have a wonderful, abundant life. It's not so he can show himself as God. It's so that we can have a great life. You know, I think we forget something in the process. Uh, in the middle of the mind of God, right in the middle of God dealing with Jonah and dealing, taking Jonah through this process and making Jonah successful and bringing Jonah out of this problem, right in the middle of the mind of God is Nineveh. 
right? Um, right in the middle of your process, you may not believe it, is, is your Nineveh. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was thinking about this. There's a Nineveh waiting for us and somehow involved in your process, there's, there's your Nineveh. Uh, I, I want to project something to you that, that I don't know if you've ever thought about. And I, I don't know if I've ever thought about it quite this way until this week. I, I want you to think about something. Uh, uh, do, do you realize that there are people that your children are going to be used by God to save? That, that your children. God's going to take your children. You're training them to be successful. You're training them, you're training them to, to have an abundant life. You're training them to get wealthy and have a good life. God's training them for that as well. But he's also training them for Nineveh. I was thinking about that in my life, you know, thinking about my son. You know, here he was with us, and we were doing pretty well. But now he's out there in a church with 20, 30,000 people. See, God, God's taking that boy. And now he's got his Nineveh. I think about Bonnie, my daughter. You know, she does the same thing with these little girls, teaching them to dance. She always influences their life. Oh, hey, Miss Bonnie. She shows them God's love. She talks to them. See, God's training them not just to be successful and to have prosperity, but he's also training them for Nineveh. Are you helping God? Are you training your children to go to their Ninevehs? You should be. Verse 6 says this, and this is, this is ah, I, want to, I want to get happy here. It says, but you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. Would, would you say that back to me? But you, God. Say that back. But you, God. We don't have projection, maybe. But you, God. Say, say that back to me one more time. But you, God. Jonah says, you brought my life up. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered. Say remembered, because I'm going to hit on this. I remembered you. Now, what Jonah says here in verse 6 is, is I remembered how you brought my life up. Now, we forget the but you God times in our lives. I was, we were singing that song today and I started crying because it's all because of Jesus. I'm alive. Now, I, I know that's a song and, and until, until you study this and you spend your week thinking about this, you don't really realize it, but it's all because of Jesus you know, that, that I, I, I'm alive and I, and I know that. And I'm going to share that with you, with you in, in, in just a second. But we forget the, the but you God times. See, your marriage seemed to be over, but you God. Uh, you got that horrible report from the doctor, but you God. You were in the belly of your distress, you know, but you God. Your kid was, was, was in this horrible situation, you know, but you, God. Remember that time that you were about to die, but you, God. I was in my late 20s. I was driving up the highway, going kind of fast like I always do. And I was, I was going up from Griffin to Atlanta on Highway 155. And I was going about 65 miles an hour. I had just passed a car. And going 65 miles an hour, I was coming back into my lane after I'd passed the car, and the steering wheel came off in my hands at 65 miles an hour. And I'm heading like this, going back into my lane, heading straight for this ditch, eight foot, six foot, eight foot ditch over here, and there is nothing I can do except cry out, Oh, God, help me! I hit the brakes, but what are you going to do? You know, the, 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 the ditch is just a few feet off. And over I went, the car flipped at 65 miles an hour and goes sliding upside down, down this ditch. I heard glass. I covered my face, dirt, glass. I said, I'm going to die right here and right now in a car crash. I was convinced it was over. I heard the grass, the metal. I was hanging in my seatbelt upside down. I felt the top of the car hitting me on my head because it was crushing in. Oh, God! Oh, God! All of a sudden, I mean, everything goes in, in slow motion. It's happening so fast. Finally, the, the, the car stops. The glass stops. The sound stops. The dirt stops. I'm still alive. I, I'm hanging upside down. I unbuckle the belt. 
whoop, fall, crawl through the broken out window. I am looking for blood. There's no blood. I, honestly, this is exactly, I patted myself. I made sure everything was still there and, and there was no blood. I'm alive. And have I said yet, there was no blood. Amen. You see, <laughs> I should have died. The officer said, you should have died, but you, God. You see, I have a Nineveh. I have a Nineveh waiting on me, and I cried out in my distress, in my big trouble. I cried out, oh, and I couldn't have been any further from God. But you, God. Just a few years ago, I was fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. Me and a friend of my nephew in the Gulf of Mexico. I was out fishing. And uh, uh, the water was rough, but I'd been in a lot rougher. And, and we'd gone out and caught bait. We were coming back in to find some calmer water to fish. And, and we were coming in, and we didn't know that the bilge pump of the, of the boat had stopped working. But the live well pump had not stopped working. And what had happened is a dead fish, a dead bait fish, had gotten into the, into the uh, exhaust for the water to go out of the live well tank, and it was overrunning into the boat. And what it was doing was going up under the floor of the boat. We couldn't see it for a long time. It was going up under the floor of the boat, and the boat was filling up with water. And my nephew's in the back, and he says, Uncle Delbert, uh, there's getting to be a lot of water back here. And I looked around, and it was. The back end of the boat was only about that far out of water. And I, so I told my friend, I said, go back there and help him get that water out of this boat. Well, when he goes to the back of the boat, the weight, put all the weight in the back of the boat and water and the, the, them too, and the water and the motor goes down. The next wave, it, it comes up and, and, the, and the engine sucks water into the, into the intake and blows the motor. Now we're in the mercy of a merciless sea and we're out there with no power with a boat full of water. And this boat is rocking. They're grabbing life vest. And the boat is rocking, and it throws them out. And we're miles offshore. It throws them out. The, the boat rolls. I cry out, help us, Jesus. The boat rolls. The radio is dead. We should have been lost at sea. No way. Amazingly, my friend had taken his t cell phone, put it in a plastic bag. It comes floating by him. <laughs> Think about it. Boats rolled, stuffs, his cell phone comes floating. He grabs it, holds it up out of the water, calls the Coast Guard, come rescue us. See, there is never no hope if you can pray. You, that you can pray. You're never, ever hopeless. And never forget, always remember, Jonah says, I remembered the but you God times in my life. And you've had them too. And we're singing that song, and we've just sang it. It's a great song. I love the song. But it's all because of Jesus. I'm alive. I'm, not, I'm just telling you. It is. Go ahead. Give the Lord a hand clap for yourself. Because it's all because of Jesus. You're alive. <laughs> but you, God. Let me see if I can finish this up. Verse 8 says, Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Cling to worthless. What was Jonah's worthless idols? What is he talking about here? <laughs> what Jonah is saying is because of my worthless idols that I got in this mess to start with. It's because of my hatred for the Ninevites. That's what got me here. My hard-headedness. That got me here. My hard-heartedness. That got me here. Those were idols that were apparent were in his life. And his clinging to these things is actually what put him in the, in the fish belly. In the belly of hell. That's why he was there to start with. I want to ask you, what do you cling to? What worthless idols are in your life? What is it? Because what they will do for you is put you in the belly of hell. They will keep you from doing what God's told you to do. Let me read you off a few that I've written down here in the notes. How about hate? How about money? Are these worthless idols? These things will put you in the belly of hell. Possessions, having things. How about your image, how your, your appearance, your, how you look? How about addictions? How about anger, lust, pornography? You better listen to Jonah. Clinging to worthless idols will only put you 
in the belly of hell. The sooner you can let go of them, the sooner you'll be free of them and out of the belly of hell. Verse 9 says, But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have what? Is it up? What I have vowed. <laughs> I will make good. <laughs> and salvation, now don't disconnect vows with salvation. What I have vowed to you, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. See, let me, let me give you a real insight. God lets us get ourselves into bad situations into bellies of hell so that we will make vows. How, let's be honest. How many of you ever in a belly of hell, in a bad circumstance, in a real, real bad time in your life, how many of you ever made a vow to God? <laughs> there you go. Now ask you another question. How many of you have kept that vow? There's a few. A few. Can I tell you something? You're going to keep it. You're, you're, you're going to keep it. God hasn't forgotten it. You hope he has. <laughs> but you see, if you don't keep it, there's another belly of hell. And in that belly of hell, you're going to do what Jonah said. I'll, I'll, I'll do it this time. I'll do it. You know, we get into these situations and we say, Oh, God, get me out of this. I'll go to church every Sunday. God, get me out of this. I'll do that tithing thing and that alms thing, and I'll do that offering thing too. <laughs> get, get me out of this, and, and I'll, I'll witness. Get me out of this. See, the Lord provided the fish. You get into places, and you're going to make vows, and God's going to collect them. Okay, just some insight. I love it. Jonah did what we all did. He made his vows in the belly of hell. Okay, Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. This is it. And the Lord commanded the fish. And what did it do? It spit him out? What did it do? It vomited him out. It vomited Jonah onto dry land. How many believe that God can command your fish? Right? <laughs> yeah, he can. Uh, and you know, when we think about that, that it, it, the fish vomited Jonah out, we think initially how gross that is. But now think about it just a second. How many of you would rather make your belly of hell sick and want your belly of hell to stop making you sick? How many of you would, when you're in that situation, you want to get out of there with some force? Right? Don't just spit me out. God commanded the fish. He'll do it for you. So how do we get out of the belly of hell? Pray. Amen? You agree with that? Pray. Go before the throne of God. Get you some mercy. Find you some grace. Do it. That's what's going to give you the keys to get out of there. God not bringing the hammer down and giving you wisdom and understanding as to what you need to do to get out of that situation. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Stop focusing on your problems. Start focusing on God. All, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see that suddenly you'll get the insights as to what to do. And then fifthly, you've got to release <laughs> those worthless idol, uh, idols. If those worthless idols are in your, in your life, they're just going to take you into the belly of hell. You've got to let them go and do what God said to do. But let me just finish it up with this. How much simpler would it just be if we just did what God said to start with? How many bellies of hell could we all avoid if we just did what God said to do to begin with. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is so insightful. Lord, we all identify with Jonah. And so, Lord, I pray today that we've heard the word of the Lord and that we're going to make a commitment to do more prayer. We're going to understand prayer better. We're going to let some idols go. We're going to approach you and seek you like we need to. How many of you would just say, Delbert, you know, that's right. I've been there. That is so true. But what I really need to do in my life is I need to come to a place where I pray more regularly. I don't wait until I'm in that belly of hell to pray. How many would go along, and I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hand as well, but how many of you would raise your hand right where you're sitting 
and say, you know what, I really do new need to commit myself to pray more. Would you raise your hand if that's you? Oh, hands everywhere. Yes. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. I ask you, Lord God, now in Jesus' name, that you will bless every single one of us here. Lord, we need to pray. I pray that every person here won't be forced to pray. That, Lord, we'll keep our vows. We won't have to be put into those positions. That, Lord, we'll just do it because we love you and do it because of Nineveh, because of those lost people that are going to go to hell unless I come into their world. And I ask you, Lord, to bless us in Jesus' name. Head still bowed, eyes still closed. You're far from God. You're right now in the belly of hell. Right now, you're going through it. Right now, you got to get out. You're going down. The hammer's coming down. Unless you come to Jesus, unless you get back to where you need to go in your life, it's going to get bad. It's going to get worse. And it's not going to be just this belly of hell. There's going to be another one and another one and another one and another one. Because without Jesus, you're not going to make it. It's all because of Jesus. I'm alive. I want to pray for you. If, if that's you, realize that Jesus went to the cross of Calvary and died for you so that you can not only have abundant life, but there are people out there that need you in their lives. There's a Nineveh for you. There's lost people that need your help. And God wants to use you in that, in that dimension. If that's you, would you please let me pray for you? Would you please give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him to give you, give you mercy and give you grace so that you can not only help yourself, but help others? If that's you, would you raise your hand right where you're sitting and let me pray for you? See your hand over here in the back. Any others? Any others? I see you, sir. Any others? 